Our next speaker is Sue O'Brien. She's the CEO of Norman Broadbent, um, and she's had a very uh, busy career. She's been the group CEO at Norman Broadbent, which is an executive search firm since 2008, where she's helped rebuild the firm's global positioning. Uh, she also created the Human Capital Consulting Group, which delivers and assesses innovative leaders for the future. In addition to this, Sue is an NED for Human Asset Development at Come Round Experiential Marketing, a founding member at the Women's Business Council and the Commercial Advisory Board for the Tissue Bank to Cancer Research Charity. And in addition to this, she chairs the National Fundraising Committee for Kids Out. So please join me in welcoming Sue O'Brien. Boom. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she was getting really worried then. <laughs> um, can I just check where the clicker is first? Is this it? Yeah, good. Um, good afternoon. I know that I've got the slot just before lunch which is going to be very difficult. Does anybody need to go to the loo? <laughs> if you do want to go, I don't mind you walking out while I'm speaking. It's not a problem at all. Um, I'm devastated that the five women that just gave you top tips have stolen my presentation. <laughs> so it would, uh, it would seem to me that the five top tips they've just given you are brilliant, brilliant ideas on how to look at the issues facing women um, in business. Before I start, how many people in the room know who they are? OK. For those women that just held their hands up, have you already got a career plan? You can speak. Yes. Right, OK. Um, how often do you review it? <laughs> when I get time on the bus, yeah, OK. So um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, really, really simple, because I know I've only got half an hour, is, oh, it slides in. There you go the empowerment cycle. So there isn't much new thought, but there is original thought. And one of the things I want to briefly take you through is what I see as how people manage their careers and how they manage to achieve what they want to achieve in life. It doesn't matter if you don't want to be a career exec. If you want to be a mum, if you want to run your own business, if you want to work in a corporate, if you want to work in a entrepreneurial business, it doesn't matter to anyone other than you. So be comfortable with the, cho the choice that you make and make it happen. And the best way to make it happen is to have in your own mind a little empowerment cycle. Start with thoughts. They have to be original. They're the only original thing you own. Your thoughts, your ideas about you and about your life are absolutely crucial to you achieving success because you will only measure yourself on the success that you achieve based on your own ideas. But what's really interesting is what's the one thing you don't allow yourself time to do? <coughs> Think. So again, coming back to the previous panelist comment, the thinking piece is absolutely crucial to you. The authenticity of your thoughts will actually create your core values. I interview people all the time. I hear trite management speak nonstop. What do you want to do? Well, I want to be an MD. Right. Why? Because uh, that's the next job. <laughs> and I mean, that's easy. If I ask a guy, they'll just tell me why. If I ask a woman, it'll be, well, because um, a male mentor has told me that's the next thing I should do. Don't ever ever say that in an interview. Own your thoughts. They need to be authentic. It needs to be about what you want, not about what someone else has told you is right. I get asked all the time, how do you think this position would look on my CV? Absolutely awful statement to make. The relevance of how a role looks and how it measures your success will change from every single consultant that you speak to. And headhunters are the worst. I know I run a headhunting company, so I'm not going to be very nice about headhunters today. So I, if there's any in the room, I apologize. Um, don't rely on a headhunter's view of your CV. Don't rely on anyone else's view of you other than your view of you. That's the most important thing. Because if you're comfortable with the view of you, you're going to be very authentic in the way that you present it. It's the base of the picture of your life, which I know sounds very fluffy, but actually it's real. 
So if you want, I'll, I'll cite someone called, does anybody know Martina King? No? She's the ex-CEO um, of Yahoo and Capital Radio. And when she was the CEO of Yahoo and Capital Radio, she stepped down from an executive career. And all of the women around her groaned and said, oh, God, why have you done that to go and raise a family? You haven't made it easy for the rest of us and everything else. But they neglected to look at what Martina had decided to do. She thought through, I'm going to get between 20 and 32 to 35 as quickly as I can up the ladder. I'm going to become very senior. And then when I take time out to look after the kids, I'm going to have already built a non-executive portfolio. So she created a non-exec portfolio, stayed at the top level while she was taking time out to look after the kids. And she's just come back now that the children are grown to an executive career again. Now, that's smart thinking. That's really good planning. And much as many people said, oh, no, she's gone to look after kids, she did the right thing. She knew where she wanted to use her brain, and she planned it all. That was the picture for her life. She knew she wanted to be senior. She knew what she wanted to do, but she didn't want to miss out on having children. So whilst, yes, you can't have it all, if you plan it and it's authentic, you can get as close to that as possible. Be really clear on your individual contribution. Again, I think someone else just said, if you look back at 90 on what you've achieved in your life, your individual contribution is just as valid to this world if it's about raising three children as it is if you were CEO of a FTSE 100 company. It doesn't really matter. It's about what you want. So forget all the advice of this is how you should do it. It's about what's in here. <coughs> Language. It's another crucial thing. Women are awful at it. My first ever board meeting, I said, I was really nervous. It was all blokes, of course. And I sat there and said, this might be a stupid question, but blah, blah, blah. The chairman, bless him, said to me afterwards, never, ever open with, this might be a stupid question, but he said, you asked the one incisive question of the whole board meeting, uh, but you undermined it and you underplayed it by your delivery. And we are, as human beings, terrible at doing this. We'll say, oh, um, I was just thinking, and, and, and I know this might not be relevant, I know I'm not an accountant, but all of the pre-qualifications that make them want to eliminate what it is you're saying. Language is so powerful. It presents you in the right way. It positions exactly what you're trying to say. It has to be positive. If I came on now, just before lunch, and I was kind of talking back down into, this is the stuff you have to do, really, and this is what, it's a waste of time. You're not going to listen to a word of it. The positive nature of how you present yourself will actually really have an impact. The strength of it. Just listen to the difference in tone of voice of a guy on a conference <coughs> call to a woman. It's really relevant. It's a really tiny thing. But if you don't think about it and you don't think about how you're projecting, you won't actually have the right uh, emphasis on what you're saying. And what you're saying, however vital, will get lost in the delivery. Confidence. Oh, If I had a pound for every time someone said to me, well, the problem with women is they just don't have the confidence of men. I don't believe that for a second. I do believe that conditioning means that if you get a group of women together in a room and they're all talking about various ideas, you can't hear yourself think because everyone's got such great energy, the second you stick somebody in front of a mic and put them on stage, they wobble. And it's almost about, are you confident being center of attention and owning an idea? Again, I come back to, you know, if you've thought it through, if your language is right, you've then got the position to have the confidence. And I think you can use that very often as an excuse. I haven't got the confidence. Or the age-old one, I will only have the confidence if I know I'm 180% sure I can do the job. A bloke needs 20% confidence <laughs> to be 130% sure that they can do the job. And they take it like that. Um, again, it's a common thing I hear all the time. Well, I really wanted to make sure I had my head down and got the job done before I went forward for that next promotion. Well, while you've got your head down, the guys have got their heads up, and that's where they're heading. So yes, it's absolutely vital that you do your jobs well and that you're insu you ensure that you're delivering, <coughs> which women are great at doing. But don't forget to look up. Otherwise, you're just looking up at the feet of the guy that's going up the stairs ahead of you. Um, I think that 
another thing is think about how you walk into a room. You know, if you want to hang around the edges of a room and not get noticed, then that is exactly what's going to happen to you in your career. In your corporate life, it, it isn't about taking all the airtime because you're saying nothing. If you're vacuous, then that isn't going to help you either. But it is about being precise about what you do and what you say. And make sure that, you know, as you walk in, don't walk in with your head down. Don't walk in furtively. Networking, women are useless at it. They don't turn up to ne networking events. I say they, I am one. What am I doing? Um, I actually don't like networking at all. I hate it. I have to do it every day, but I hate it. The way I get around it is I will walk into a room and I will look at one or two people that look uneasy. It's a really good trick, this. Um, and I'll walk up to them and go, God, I hate networking, don't you? And then they'll go, oh, yeah, I hate it too, I hate it too. And it's one of the best ways of actually then building relationships. Because everyone else in the room feels the same way. The boys won't have an issue with it. They call it well-connected. <laughs> okay. So again, think about what I said earlier about language. You think networking is bad because you think it's a vacuous waste of time and you've got too many things to do and I've got to balance work and getting home and I, how am I going to do that? And networking is like, oh, God, you have to have stupid conversations with people that don't matter. Um, <laughs> no. How many people have not gone to an event because they've gone through that thought process? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, come on, be honest. We had an event. We invited 300 women out of the FTSE 350. 300 women. It was all chairmen um, in terms of the event. It was a really big event. I hand-wrote the personal invitations to the women and said, I'm a female chief exec of a listed business. I'm filling the room with chairmen and board directors from the FTSE 350, will you please come to this event? <coughs> Guess how many turned up? Come on, come on, interactive, come on. 6%. 6%. And that's not unusual. Guess how many of the guys turned up? 95%. <laughs> it's a room full. Um, but that isn't unusual, because we will always think that we're the least priority. And that's one of the dangers. The language you use about yourself and the importance of don't dismiss networking because it's a word you don't use. Use a word like connecting if that suits you better. But don't just dismiss it out of hand because the guys won't. Now, in terms of owning mistakes, I've got to admit <coughs> that, there you go, my slides are out of order because I didn't take the time to read them. Um, <laughs> always admit your mistakes, that's one of the others. Actions. So if I look at my cycle, what are actions? Actions are really important. The most important action you can take as an executive is to listen. Because when you listen, you can pick up the stuff that other people are missing because they're too busy speaking. It's one of the most crucial things I've learned in my career. Most guys will go into a boardroom and they'll all be on transmit. They won't look at the body language of the other people in the meeting. They won't be taking account of what is being said. They'll be too busy thinking, I need to make that point, I need to make that point. The listening piece of what a woman can bring to a boardroom, and I'm going to be very, very gender specific here, is absolutely awesome. And I call it the, the boardroom peeing up the wall. So with my, I've, I, literally, I've, I've, I've got four accountants on my board, lucky me. Um, and I've got, there's two women, so there's eight of us, two women, four accountants, and then some, some other folk. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to remember what they do, actually, for a living. Oh, sales, OK. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I find really fascinating is I will actually say it to them in the board meetings. Now, obviously, it's a board that I've been on for a number of years, so I'm very comfortable saying this. But when I start to see the banter of the accountants and then maybe someone else sort of fighting about the issue in hand, I'll just say, guys, the wall's over there. Pee up against it as much as you like. Can we actually get on with the strategy? <laughs> now, I know that might sound a little gross and not terribly professional, but it gets to the point really quickly, really quickly. And again, coming back to language, it's language that they will take notice of and not expect from me. The first time I was in a board meeting and somebody swore and somebody else apologized to me, I swore worse. Because I just wanted to make the point, I'm in this room as an executive. 
I am not in this room as a woman. And that's, again, one of the really important things. So I took the action, I owned the language, it was positive, and it had an impact. <coughs> Make sure you ask positive questions. Don't be too driven to say, I don't think that's going to work because. One of the things that women sometimes think they have to do in their exec career is point out the faults. Don't. If there are faults to be pointed out, try and construct the challenge in a very positive way. You will then be seen as a solution provider, not an awkward woman. And I hate to say this, but the labels that guys will throw at us in boardrooms and through your career are there. There's no point trying to pretend they're not. So always look about your positive questioning, but take accountability. It's my fault the slides were wrong. It is. I can't blame my PA, because she said, have you checked them? And I was really confident that they were fine. And I said, yeah, they're fine. Take accountability of mistakes. Again, it will create a unique impression, because the guys won't. But take accountability whilst you have a positive solution of what's gone wrong at the same time. It means that you are ready to be an executive. Any executive that isn't ready to take accountability shouldn't be around a board table. And I know I'm focusing very much on board, but this is, you know, for board, read team meeting, read, you know, a working party, read any experience that you have. <coughs> Claim your involvement. Don't be ashamed of saying, I did this. It was my idea. Be sensitive, again, come back to the EQ piece. Be sensitive to the environment that you're in and don't be obnoxious, saying I did everything. If you're in a team and the team needs credit, say what I led the team to, what I led the team to do, or the team and I achieved this. There are ways in which you can phrase it, again, it's coming back to language. There are ways in which you can fra phrase it that doesn't make you seem like you control the world, but it does ensure people know what you've achieved. The number of women, I can tell you, it will go just like that. The number of women that will talk about, we did this, the business did that, essentially what Xerox achieved was. And I, I just have to be fairly blunt with them and say, well, what part did you play in that? Oh, well, I was involved, of course. Well, what does that mean? Were you leading it? Did you come up with it? And then sometimes women will say, oh, well, I wouldn't necessarily claim ownership for it, but yes, I suppose it was under my tenure. You are competing. The next candidate that comes in, if he's a bloke, he will have actually created the fourth bridge. <laughs> you know, even though it's obviously well documented that it was someone else's idea. I once interviewed, is anyone from BA here? Okay. Um, I once interviewed 15 people that designed the flatbed seat in BA. <laughs> 14 of them were men. The one that did it was a woman. Right, so in terms of the next stage, it's actually about actions. Think about your progression. I know I've talked earlier about uh, how you achieve your progression. It should be steady. It's a staircase with landings, not an escalator. Escalators go quickly up, they can come quickly down. And if you don't believe that, then you can ask um, various executives that have hit that dizzy heights very early who are now hiding in other organizations because they failed. It should be steady. You should evaluate where you are, plan it again, look at what you want to achieve. Have you actually thought through your progression? Have you done what you want to do? Take those landing points on the staircase to say, right, I've got to here, and I want to get to the next stage. You're not going to do it all from 20. We, at the Women's Business Council, one of the things we've identified is there are three life cycles. There's the starting out piece where you leave school, don't know what you want to do, haven't got a clue, or some of you might have a clue and then change your mind later. So allow yourself the time to plan that bit properly. Then the midpoint career, you have different decisions to make. That's when the childcare stuff is going to come into play. Plan that. You need to have a different approach to that than you need to have when you return to work. And the returning to work thing is crucial. If ever there was a time for women to reclaim executive accountability, it's now. Because as more people return to the workforce, and they have to, more employers are now looking for older executives. Everything used to be talent and young. Now they actually want some experience. And it's a great time for women to actually get back into the workplace, not sit there and say, I'm 45. I've had five years out looking after kids. Where am I going to go? I'll have to set up my own business. If you decide to do that, fine. But own it, plan it 
take accountability for what you do and don't complain that you're not CEO of Lloyd's. <laughs> don't think you'd want to be. Um, I think the final bit is that, um, sorry, if I come back to the results. No, actions, that was the one that I didn't want. Habits. If you do everything that we've talked through this morning in terms of language, ownership, authenticity, your ideas, taking the time to plan, they'll actually turn into very authentic habits. When I'm interviewing people for, for roles in my executive search business, I pick the authentic candidate. I hear the same management, trite sentences time and time again. Do not practice the great phrases, because they are so boring. What you should do is you should let your CV and your bio reflect who you are and what your skills and capabilities are. That's what you should be thinking about. When you come into the room, that's what you should be presenting, because that is the most compelling presentation of looking at an executive. I think the final point that I'd like to make is that if you know what your habits are and you get feedback because you're listening and you need to make some habits stick or break some habits, take it on board. Feedback is actually the gift that you get to change some of the direction. You know that in Harry Potter, the staircase moves all the time and changes? That's almost how you have to think about your life because planning it at 20 and expecting it to be the same at 55 isn't going to happen. You need to look at every single turn of, and, and change that you get. Take the feedback, check that you're on point with where you want to get to, and that will create your reputation for delivering what you do. And unfortunately, you get them back to think again. So as you get through all of those phases in each part of your career, you then have to come back and think again. And it doesn't matter if you change. I'm on my third career. I'm 47. I didn't expect to be doing the job I'm doing now, but my skill set hasn't changed from when I was 20. And I hope that was useful. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. So are there any questions for Sue? And if the first question is, why didn't you get a job and I've interviewed you for a short list, I apologize. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question. I found all your advice very useful. Um, I just wonder if there's anything you can add, um, even if you might not be interviewing these kind of candidates. But when you're running your own business, sometimes some of these things are very much applicable. I just mm. wonder if there's something you could add for those of us who are running Yeah, I, I mean, one of the tricks... Uh, sorry, I'm going to come behind this thing. I'm too short to stand behind a lectern. Um, one of the things I'd definitely advise you is always look at the external market when you're running your own business. Never, ever become too internally focused. It's almost the same as your career. So, you know, I said don't keep your head down and not look up. It's the same when you're running a business. You always have to be thinking about where's the disintermediation in my market? What's going to be the disruption? The more you think about the forward game, the more likely you are to have a business that succeeds. So we put together, no, actually, I'll use my own advice. I put together a board strategy uh, about four years ago, anticipating that social media uh, would disrupt the recruitment market. So I now run a business that has four different streams. We've got a social media stream, we've got a mid-market stream, we've got a leadership consultancy business and a search business. Now, I didn't do that just because I'm clever. I did it because I've got shareholders that will look at me and say, well, why is your, mar why is your margin shrinking? Why is your market shrinking? And what's the strategy? So I think that's the one piece of advice I would, you know, use this cycle. By the way, I pinched this. This isn't my idea. So the empowerment cycle, I kind of feel, empowers me to use it to you. Um, so I would say one of the things that I would do is, is use this model, because I have used it for years, use this model for anything. It could be about what you decide to do with your life. It could be about what you decide as a strategy for your business. But I've always found it incredibly useful. I, I hope that helps. Too many people want to ask questions. Is it on? Can you hear me? Hi. 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 Um, in the last panel, the, I thought it was very interesting that most of the people had a story where that at some point in their life, they took a pay cut in their advance. Yeah. And as a person, I empathized, you know, life's too short um, to suffer. But as a headhunter from your position, what was your reaction? 
Um, if you can afford to do it, and it's to do something you want to achieve, what's wrong with that? Um, have I ever done it? I've done it, actually. Yeah. I, um, when I moved from um, being in a bigger business to going into what was a basket case of an organisation, um, but I knew that I had the opportunity to be managing director of it. So I could see the long game in terms of why I was, was going to do it. I moved away from earning much bigger bonuses where I was, accepting the fact that this was going to be a turnaround of the business and then lead on to being a PLC director. So I, I got my end game, but I owned that decision. And I think it, it's totally dependent on you. In all honesty, if you present that case, as I say, very authentically to a headhunter who's assessing you, as long as it's authentic, then that's absolutely fine. If you're doing it because you don't think you can get another job, that's a different situation. And therefore, I think it depends very much on the individual. And at the end of the day, take no notice of what the headhunter might think. They're only going to be interested in, can I place this person really quickly and will you fit in my client? They, sorry about this. A lot of them will tend not to care about you as an individual. I know that may, might make you feel like me, but, but I think sometimes people place far too much importance on headhunters. At the end of the day, they're facilitators. You always have to impress them and present the right case to them, but don't view yourself through their perspective, because you'll have run a bigger business than they will. We have one more here. Hi, my name's Gemma. Thanks for Hi. a very informative talk. I'd just like to know, I'm in a low-level management position now, and my goal is... Put the mic Sorry. Yeah, I'm in a low-level management position now, and my goal is to get onto an executive or board in, say, 15 to 20 years. What advice do you have? Do you advise specialising in the industry that I'm interested in and changing jobs, or is it really just doing what you're passionate about and timing of roles? Do you mind me being a bit cruel? Yes. Okay. You do mind, <laughs> or is that no, okay? I mean, yes, go ahead. Don't start the question no, with ahead. I'm in a lower management job. I am. <laughs> no, you're not. It's I'm only lower relative to the person sitting above you. So well, what you have to do up. is you have to, an you have to start that question with, I want to get into an executive position. Remember the things I was saying earlier? Um, in terms of should you go for breadth rather than have specialist experience, I don't know what you do, so I wouldn't be able to give you direct advice. My personal view is the broader you are as an individual, the more likely you are to be able to take on a broader role in the future, um, unless you're in a, a law firm where actually the depth of knowledge, if you like, that sort of T that goes down in terms of specialist knowledge is, is what, what is valued. Um, if you haven't had P&L, profit and loss responsibility, and if you haven't managed a budget, and if you can't read numbers, don't expect to ever get on a board. You have to. It would be irresponsible and against the combined code for anyone to put you on a board if you don't know how to read a balance sheet. There are fantastic ways you can get to learn. Um, the FT are running a, a sort of induction course. There are loads of headhunters that run courses on it. There are loads of lawyers and accountancy firms that run courses on it. Go on one. If you go into an interview and you want a broader management role and you don't understand finances, you're wasting your time and you're wasting theirs. I so I would, go, I, I would go for breadth, but I don't know what you do, so I might be giving you the wrong advice. You're an accountant. <laughs> um, in an accountancy firm or in-house? Finance and Media Company. Personally, I would make sure you get some breadth in there to show that you can actually do commercial stuff, not just count the beans, so to speak. Sorry? Well, I wouldn't come and talk to this business school if I didn't actually <laughs> value them. Um, an MBA is great, but you have to demonstrate what you're going to do with it. So it gives you a passport and it gives you a badge. You then have to demonstrate that you know what you can do with it and, and sort of act on it fairly quickly. So again, it's taking the actions. You've got the badge, now you need to do something deliverable. So we have time for just one more question. You're eating into your lunch now. I don't mind. Thank you very much. Um, just a question. Have you seen a trend in the, in the market of specific industries more likely to employ uh, females at executive level? Oh, God, I hate Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. Um, is there anyone here from the 30% club? Can we, can we cut the filming on this bit? Um, I, I have a very personal view, and it's not a very popular one. Um, <laughs> The whole initiative that's, that's recently come in about quotas and the 30% club and, and putting um, boards under the cosh to appoint women uh, 
hasn't done anyone any favours, if I'm honest. What's happened is the trend has been to just bring in a non-exec at the top of the tree, and probably one that's been recycled from somewhere else. And it increases the stats, but it actually doesn't help the women further down. So in terms of the talent pipeline, every organisation, every organisation that we deal with at the moment is asking the question. In some ways, there's never been a better time to be a woman that wants to progress in, in industry. You should be making the most of that, but don't use it. So you have to be a good executive rather than be a great woman. And I think as long as you focus on that, it doesn't matter what industry you want to go into, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, there are some where you know, it would be easier for you to get appointed into an engineering company than it would into a retail business, because the engineering companies can't get women to join. So if you want to cheat, then go to um, organizations or industries that are renowned for not having the right quota, and you'll probably get treated like a god. Um, Ruby McGregor Smith, who's the chief exec of Mighty, um, will, will uh, often get used as a role model. And she's a female chief exec, she's an ex-accountant, and she's Asian. And therefore, she will say the thing that annoys her the most is sometimes people look at those three criteria and they think she's a token. She's a really great business leader, fantastic in leadership commercially and from a team perspective. So sometimes the whole quota piece can actually annoy those of us that have already got there and not necessarily help anyone that's coming through. But now's the time to use it or make the most of it, not use it. Anyone else? Or do you want to go to get some food? You've been holding your hand up for ages. Go on. Stand up. You don't need a mic. Go on. No, I don't. Um, a quick question around your habits. Uh, can you share with us uh, what, what, what my habits are? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the powerful ones that you took on that have really changed things for you and then the ones that you had to break to... One of the sentences I use most in my life, particularly if I'm honest while dealing with men in powerful positions, is asking them how they feel about something. Um, and then waiting the hour and a half <laughs> until they take a breath again. Um, I think, I think the, the one habit I've got that I'm very, very strong on um, is emotional intelligence. So being able to read a room, I think it's a, oh, I've just spotted a man there, hello. <laughs> See, emotional intelligence, there you go. There's an example of it. Um, you all right? Yeah. How do you feel? Um, it's, it's something that humour, obviously, is, is something that I use quite a lot, but it can only work if, it's, um, if it isn't silly. I know that humour and silly is, is a strange thing to say. Um, but emotional intelligence is definitely the one thing that I would say is the most powerful for most female executives. The listening thing without any hesitation. Opening with a question that allows someone else to speak. Recognising the airspace. That's really important, and it's something that I use a lot. And not operating with fear. I became a much, much, much better executive when I was prepared to get fired for everything I said. And I know that might sound extreme, but when we, when I, no, not when we, when I, when I led the takeover of Norma Broadbent in 2008, it was a business that was twice the size of the organization I was running. Um, so it was a reverse IPO. It was December the 2nd, 2008, just at the point that the market was going south. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to fire the six biggest, bi six, the six biggest billers in the business in the first two months. So I had to go into the board and say, you need these people to go. Yeah, their reaction was a bit like that. <laughs> Um, and I said, because if we want to build this brand and we want to create this environment and create this culture and really make a difference, we can't have these behaviours. The business was about to go bust. It was about to go bust because of the behaviours and the culture and the environment that these people had created. If I didn't get rid of them, there was no way I was ever going to make the business work. And I said to the board, if I'm wrong, you won't even have to pay me notice. That's how strongly I believe it. Now, there are only so many times you can play that card in your life in terms of verbalizing it, but it was a very powerful message to them. And it was also something I absolutely, completely, authentically believed. 
And that's probably one of the most important things. So, so operating without fear, it stops you being political, it keeps you authentic. And at the end of the day, you can get another job. It's harder to work in an environment where you're compromising your principles and values every day than it is to get another job. So that they would be the habits that I've got. Thank you very much.